Good afternoon. Welcome to Treasures. Um, actually, called tre the Treasures in the Archives. It should, should be actually uh, Worcestershire Treasures. Uh, this part one of hopefully what will be a series of um, of talks. Uh, we did a, a Worcester one uh, about three weeks ago for Love Worcester, um, but we're now expanding it to, to look. I do apologise. Um, so the, the purpose of these talks is sharing some of our treasures. Now, treasures is uh, can be interpreted in many um, different ways. Uh, so we are Worcestershire Archive and Archaeology Service, bringing together the County Archives, Local Studies Library, and then the Archaeology Service, the field section of people who go out and dig, uh, the curatorial side, the advisors, uh, for planning uh, in countryside, um, as, well, as well as the historic environment record, with thousands of entries on their databases. And a number of years ago, we had a series on our um, on our website. So I was trying to just see whether that can be. Saved a bit more, so you can see a little bit more. Um, it says a treasure where we'd come together and we interpreted it quite widely um, so to provide everybody with opportunities to their, their type of service. Um, there's very little silver and gold and precious material in, in, in some ways within these. Um, it said we are interpreting it quite widely. Um, and it is fairly appropriate because uh, Worcestershire just, I will. This sadly is not displaying quite as it should do. Uh, but Worcestershire Countryside Treasure was a booklet that was produced that was, in many ways, it was the start of the historic environment record, uh, detailing some of the key uh, treasures in the countryside, buildings, and sites um, that, that we had. And so this was what we then decided that we would. Um, so for, for the, the blog series, call it treasures. So we did, did interpret it quite widely, and so we're going to be sharing probably about five in each of these because these are just short lunch time talks, about twenty five minutes. If you have um, questions, we'll try and see whether we can have opportunities to uh, to look at those um, at the end. Um, so I said it's, it's quite wide that it was interpreted by different members of staff about what they would choose. And quite often, I don't think they are in, in terms of financial things, treasures. However, they are important to us and important to the county and customers. Customers also and our users suggested things. So the first one that we're going to look at uh, today is Shakespeare's Marriage Bond. It's Shakespeare Week this week, um, a week to, to celebrate the, uh, the works of, of, uh, of William Shakespeare. And in the archives, we have Shakespeare's marriage bond, which in some ways is a little bit surprised. Lots of times when we've mentioned to people, say, why isn't it in Stratford? And the reason is that Shakespeare needed to come here to get his marriage license in order to get married to Anne Hathaway by license rather than by bans, which is when people uh, have their, um, their marriage announced in three successive Sundays. Uh, that system still takes place. But there are exceptions and you can get a license and you can get married quicker. One reason could be that Anne Hathaway was pregnant and so might get married quickly. Um, it can also be that just you don't want it being said about in church and everybody can know what's happening. But also, because he got married in November, um, the bands weren't always read at that particular time. So wanting to get on with it. Um, so zooming in, in the... Uh, there is underlined William Shakespeare or Shakespeare with an X, and he's mentioned on, in this uh, in the in the marriage bond. There's several marriages on here. I mean, we have thousands upon thousands of names in the marriage licenses. Mostly, they're just of interest if they happen to be your ancestor. Some of those do do stand out, and this is one of the very rare documents about William Shakespeare, the person, as opposed to his plays. Um, so, of course, nobody realised that this was going to be important to be kept uh, and going to stand out at that particular time. 
So um, it's one of many, and it's only later that I think people realised that, oh, actually, this is uh, this is more important because it's of somebody who is who is relatively famous. So we have uh, William Shakespeare. So he was in the Di- Stratford was in the Diocese of Worcester, hence having to come to Worcester in order to get this. Um, and it says that he marries Anne Hathaway of Stratford. He would then go and take away his uh, marriage license so he could get married. Um, this is this was kept within the diocesan collection, which is why we have it. So far, so fairly straightforward. It's interesting because it mentions William Shakespeare, and that's often good enough for many. It has been used on TV and in one or two major exhibitions. But the other document that goes alongside is the Bishop's Register, which is the third of the document. The license goes with the person, to get, so you can take it and get married. The bond is in there, and also the Bishop's Register. And on here, highlighted, is mentioned that William Shakespeare um, and Anne Waitley of Temple Grafton have got married. Who's Anne Waitley? Um, now, I think this was done about, uh, um, they were done about a day or two apart. So it has been suggested, was he going to marry Anne Waitley? And then maybe he was forced to marry Anne Hathaway because she was pregnant with his child. Um, are there any other, you know, there's also, there have been a number of theories that have, that have cropped up that people have suggested. Is there a particular reason for this? Um, the answer possibly is that it's just a clerical error. You know, it's being written down by somebody. Uh, Temple Grafton, there's a court case happening there and Waitley, I think it was mentioned a little bit earlier on. So maybe the clerk, when he's writing it down, had a slip of the mind and he put the wrong name and place. Which does make you think how many other documents within the archives may, may, there could be that are like that. And if we didn't have the, the, the bond, we just had the register, that would confuse us even more. Um, we also, going alongside that, we have um, the St Martin's in the Corn Market parish registers. Now, where did Shakespeare get married? We don't know. He could have taken his license and got married in any of the churches in Worcestershire or in the Diocese of Worcester. Uh, various churches say he got married with, with them, including Stratford-upon-Avon, um, but he doesn't appear in their registers. Other ones, the registers haven't survived, so you can't prove either way. Old St Martins claim that he got married there, and potentially that was on the route out towards Stratford. And there are some pages missing. So he got married 1582, and then there's suddenly a little bit of a jump to 1584, and a page has been removed. Now, was this because somebody saw William Shakespeare's name in the registers and thought, ah, I'll either put it for safekeeping or I will perhaps um, put it on whatever the equivalent at the time of eBay was and sell it? Now, the answer is we don't know, and when we give people tours around, there's all sorts of theories that people can put up, some quite creative. Um, all we can say is that we can't say one way or the other. This is, um, this is quite plausible. They got married there, and that's why the register like that. But we can't say for certain. Um, so until anything else crops up, uh, there's a bit of mystery, and there's still about six churches claiming he got married with them. So just the whole... Th- the story behind it, you know, adds to it. I mean, if you just had one of, uh, just had, you know, one document of Shakespeare's name on, that would be fascinating, um, being that sort of, such a famous person. But having this particular story just makes it, make these things stand out. And we do enjoy showing people around when, when they come on visits. One of, one of the, of the uh, documents that we have, um, uh, is the, with, that that um, that, we did, that we're sharing today is this manorial music um, from probably about the 14th century, and you think, oh well, that that's nice. You've got some uh, manor- you give, you know, you've you've got some medieval music, and um, you know, lots of places will will have these, such as the, the cathedral archives. Well, this one is a little bit different because it survived by accident. We actually don't have very much music. I mean, wouldn't necessarily do that isn't our, our specialism but what stands out for this one is that it has survived because it was on the back of um, of, of some manorial court documents 
So uh, 1420 at the at the Kemsey Memorial Court, somebody is um, the, whoever is the clerk is writing things down, and either he's forgotten his notebook or else he's run out and he needs something to write on. We've all had it, you know, you look for an envelope, back an envelope or something when we need to write something down. And this is what it seems he did, because this is actually the back of um, a document where it's listing what's happening, um, people taking other people to court, paying fines in, in, in Kemsey, the kind of everyday De detail. The manorial documents are absolutely fascinating for the you know the minute of detail of how land is managed within a particular area and disputes um, are, are, are sorted out. But here is that this is we found this on the back when we were going through it. Uh, there was a chantry chapel dedicated to the Blessed Virgin that had been founded in 1316, and this is um, a, a, an antiphon to the Virgin Mary, Alleluia, Virgin Jesse. Uh, and we have the, the notes, we have what it would have been like. And so it's tempting to say, because it's in, in Kemsey, that maybe it was there, maybe there the priest was there. He had this these sheets and it was well, I actually, and the clerk says, I need these, and then wrote on the back. So some of what survives in the archives is by accident. Such as, as this, as I said, so it was this, this lovely, uh, unexpected surprise when we found it. Um, and then just seeing this early uh, musical notations, which is which just gives a fascinating insight. And, and you think how much has survived just by accident, just because something's been written on. There's loads of examples we've got in the archive where things were just within, within other things are used almost as folders and therefore have survived. And so this wonderful accidental survive, survival and said is, is where um, early music in our archives led it to be suggested as, as one of our one of our treasures. And you can there see the, the words sort of make out Alleluia. Um, another treasure is a, an archaeological one, are the remains of Roman ovens, which again possibly you might not necessarily think would be uh, treasure it doesn't look especially attractive um, and it's, it's made of very rough material and it's probably kind of everyday material um, but then one of the reasons is that when we were excavating on the site of the hive back 11 12 years ago this helped solve a big puzzle because we've been coming across some of these um, pieces of pottery and we, we could tell there's kind of a bit of a curve it was something a little bit unusual but we didn't know what because you're only finding really small pieces what were they we knew that they were roman um, but what were they on the site of the hive we found several of these and there was enough material that, that we could start putting it back together and start working out that it's actually an oven um, sort of cone shape, and that is the um, kind of the plate that would would go in, and that is kind of a, a replica that has been made, and um, and that is actually in the hive. So when we're able to come back, you can see it on level two in a cabinet. But because it helped solve this problem, he said, and so uh, we could go back to other places, there's other places around the country as well, like Chester, that had found this sort of material. Um, and he said it solved this puzzle, solved this problem, because uh, we found so many, we put it together and work out what it was. I mean, some people joked about it, it's like a pizza oven, so maybe it was one of the first Domino pizzas um, in, in Worcester. Possibly, yeah. um, so it was fantastic, it helped to rewrite things. Um, However, how, how exactly did it work? And we're fortunate in just um, about two or three years ago, uh, we managed to work with um, somebody who, who does reconstruction pottery and King's School and some other local schools and uh, um, a field historian to have a go at doing a replica one and have it and, and baking in it and seeing, seeing what happened. And we're really pleased to be able to uh, to see the results. It was uh, they did it at an open date King's School, and it did work well. Now we've got to remember that back then they would have been used to it, you know, on a daily basis using it. Whilst with us, it was a bit experimental, but it certainly works. 
it keeps the heat. You can cook in it. Exactly what you can cook, we're, we're still working out. Um, but yeah, there's all sorts of options there. Uh, and so we've been able to share that to people in this country and also in Europe and saying, well, actually, if you find this, these sorts of material, this is what it uh, could be, a Roman oven. So, yeah, the remains bit of pottery that don't look special but what it signified and what we were able to tell from that was absolutely fantastic was enabling us to um, understand far more about the Romans and their cooking and on various sites we suddenly knew what these particular pieces of pottery were. Now with archives when we when we describe uh, what you know what archives are um, all sorts of ways of describing it is it confuses a bit to do with on your phone it'll have would you like to archive this which is using a slightly different word that um, the archivists in our service mean it um, but generally it's understood archives are mostly paper material but we also have a few other items that have almost come across or survived by accident within our our collections such as this purse which it comes from the Solworth um, parish collections um, and it partly came to us because when it because for many years it stored in it a letter from the future Charles II because when he came to Worcester um, in 1651 and then there's the subsequent Battle of Worcester, uh, Worcester's defences weren't uh, in a fit condition and he knew that the parliamentarian armies were, were in, in, um, encircling and that there would be a battle and so he sent instructions to all the parishes around Worcester telling them to send men to Worcester to help build the defences and they were to build, uh, bring their own spades and uh, other tools to do that. Um, incidentally, after the battle, the Parliamentarian army oh, sent you know, a similar instruction to all the parishes around telling them to send men to take down the, um, the defences so the local people were caught in a bit of no man's land. Um, so it was decided at some stage in the parish to keep this letter from the, the king in this, this lovely purse. Uh, the purse, again, it's an, almost an accidental survival because it would have been, originally it would have been something else. Uh, it's something called um, Opus Anglicanum, which is called English work, which was a special type of needlework um, in, the, in the 13th or 14th century. Probably it was something else, maybe some... Um, elaborate robes for use within the church and then at some stage it was turned into a purse. Now this is one of the rare bits where there actually is gold in one of the treasures because this purse contains some gold thread. It is be it is really beautiful, it would have been expensive, it is something that would have been really um, important uh, within the, within the, 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 the parish uh, collections and so it was something that would be almost uh, pride of place within uh, say within those collections um, and it's been something that it is really really high uh, artistic needlework and many years ago the Victorian Albert Museum borrowed it for a display on Opus Anglicanum it seems a really important example and for um, Another exhibition they did on it a couple of years ago, they did come and have a look, but they decided for various reasons not to use it. But they did say once again what a wonderful example it is of that. So maybe at some, some stage with religious changes it was decided not to use whatever robe it was, and then it was converted into a, well, what we refer to as a purse to keep that document within it. Um, within it there are, um, there are unicorns um, and dogs, and the lion and various lattice work when you look in. Um, it said it's, it's, it's beautifully done, uh, patterned with those pictures in as well. Um, absolutely amazing to, to look at. Um, as in many ways, we wouldn't normally have it, but because it was part of the parish collection and it was with that document, it was decided that it was best to, to keep it within the archives. If normally, then it wouldn't be the sort of thing we have, but it's beautiful. I mean, we have occasionally shown it in our display cabinets. Um, just to, uh, to finish with, uh, another archaeological one, uh, the Iron Age honeypot. Now, this is something that, that came to us um, 
a little while ago and it had been found an excavation not by our own archaeologists but um, some other archaeologists in Tibetan who were doing some work in advance of, of a housing scheme but they used our archaeologists because of their um, knowledge of local finds to do the, the finds report and to do some of, of that uh, post-excavation work. When, when archaeologists go out and dig, that is only part of the story, it then comes back into the office to be looked at, to be examined and reports to be written about. And so uh, in amongst the things that came back was uh, this tub containing pottery and that there was um, some sort of pot inside and it was kind of lifted as a whole so it could be excavated back in the office but under better conditions and um, to see what could we discover from that because sometimes with pots you can find um, all sorts of residual things at the bottom what were they eating and drinking what was in there or was it cremation bones what was stored within there can be really important cremation sorry not cremation, yeah, really important um, environmental evidence um, so this is what it looked like uh, obviously from an aerial view uh, looking down um, but with the archaeologist eagle eye they managed to work out that there was um, a, a pot there and so they managed to uh, excavate it and bring it in and then Susie, one of our environmental archaeologists, was looking there and then was, was looking at the environmental samples inside. And within that was finding various pollens. So you have to try and, uh, which, you know, you can't see with the naked eye, but it's uh, sometimes with uh, be washing and with sieves and then putting it under the microscope to try and work out what's there. Which can also say about things like what the environment was like as well, what trees or plants and things were growing. Having a look at um, what was in there, it was the sort of uh, pollen that um, are very, very popular with bees, sort of um, insect pollinating ones. And after looking at the types of things that were there and the amounts, one suggestion that was put forward that was maybe what had been in the pot had been honey, either as honey itself or maybe something like mead, a, um, a honey-based um, honey drink. Um, back, in, this was um, an Iron Age pot, and in that period, uh, we didn't have sugar, of course, and so there's very few things that would provide sweetness, so honey would be very important. Um, and so the honey itself has disappeared, but the pollens within seem to have remained within the pot. And this is quite unusual, and so, when we're asking for suggestions for, um, for Worcestershire treasures, this one was suggested because it was unusual, but it gives that insight into, you know, this shows that we can work out a little bit um, about what uh, people may have been um, eating and drinking in the past, an example of evidence. I mean, we can't be 100% sure, but certainly uh, it's gives, it's, it's, it is highly likely that that is the case, you know, uh, why would it be this type of pollen? As I said, we can't say 100%, but I think they were sure enough to say, this is quite probable, we can't pr prove it exactly, um, but we think that is that is the case. And it's always fascinating when you can find that little evidence, that trace, to, you know, to find out what people have been eating and things, because a lot of that doesn't survive. When I gave the Worcester Treasures talk about three weeks ago, um, I mentioned about the grains of paradise that was found in the cesspits. That's one of the other ways of finding out what people ate. But sometimes you have to um, go through pots and trying to do um, and take uh, samples from what's left behind, you know, residual stuff from cooking, provide uh, some of that evidence. Um, all right. I had a couple just in case that. Um, there was time, but that brings us back to about 25 past one. And I said, I'm trying to keep that to about, um, I to keep that to about, about 25 minutes. Um, I'm just having a quick look in case anybody has put any any questions down on the, on the live chat. Ruth said that the person is beautiful. Yes, it is. It is absolutely amazing um, when you're looking at it. And you know, on so many levels, the artistic work, also the expense that was put into it. Um, and it's great that it is known wide in the field of those who study that type of needlework to see what it is. And it is so good that it has survived. A lot of it hasn't because it can be quite delicate 
or you know things lose its its purpose and go, and it and it doesn't always survive. Um, so thank you very much for joining us for this brief look at um, some of the Worcestershire treasures that um, that we have within the collections. Um, there will be another talk in um, on the seventh of April about fi uh, finds in a month from last year, which my colleague Ian will be sharing about some of the finds that we shared on our blog, talking a little bit about four or five of those, and then probably um, a couple of weeks after that, I'll be back for part two of Worcestershire Treasures. As I said, we had over fifty to choose from, and so just going to up four or five at a time, we'll have seven of these to share what we've got, as I said, and the wide range that they were. In interpreted. Uh, we hope to see you back in the in the hive soon. We are hoping that in April we'll be able to reopen and you can come and have a look maybe at some of these things and find your own treasures. Uh, keep an eye out on our social media and website for, for, for more details. Um, so thank you very much for joining us and we hope to see you soon for one of our future